In this video, I'm going to cover the Anycubic Slicer. So we'll talk about uh, the lay of the land. We'll um, go through settings. I'll, I'll tell you my understanding of what a lot of the settings do. Also show you the settings that I'm using. And if, if that's all you're looking for is the settings, you can go right to the timestamp at the end of the video. Um, and I've got a montage there just running through um, the settings zoomed in. So um, without further ado, let's just kind of talk about the lay of the land with any cubic slicer. So um, when you set this up for the first time, you're going to get a raw build plate that is indicative of the build volume that is designed for the printer uh, that you have selected. So if you go into settings, uh, the printer, and you look at the machine limits, uh, or maybe it's under general, general. Um, you've got your X, Y, and Z axis. So your build plate represents this volume. So 430 millimeters wide, 430 millimeters deep. Uh, and then the slicer will enable me to slice anything that's up to 500 millimeters tall. Um, to bring an object in, um, you just hit the import button and um, I'll just select this um, um, file that I created, which is a, um, aluminum extrusion profile in 8080 or 8020, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so with this brought in, it automatically tried to put it on the build plate for me, uh, but you can see there's an error, it's outside of the available build plate volume. Um, so to orient this, what we're gonna do is hit this place on face button. That will highlight all of the faces of the object, and then I can select a particular face to put down on the build plate. And now it's uh, vertical orientation. And um, I can tell you just because I created this, we're just under 500 millimeters tall. It's uh, 19 and a half inches is how long I made this extrusion. So kind of cool there. Um, also just show you, uh, if we look at a top down view, you'll see um, it gives me kind of like an AutoCAD view of the object. And that's because in the preferences, I turned off using perspective camera. Uh, if you turn this setting on, it's going to try to give you this like rendered view, uh, which I just, I don't like that whatsoever. It kind of gives you your, what your eye would see. I'd rather see it this way. So that's why I have that turned off. Okay. So now that we have our object, let's just talk about a couple of the menu options over here that I think you need to know to get started. Um, and so first and foremost, you have movement. And if you want to be precise with movement, um, you can select that with your object selected and then you can drag just left, uh, just forward and back or just up and down, but I'm not sure why you would, uh, why you would do that. Uh, or you can hit move to center and that will put the object in the center of the build plate. And so far, uh, I haven't really used much of Prusa slicer, but in Cura, I haven't seen this move to center button. So really it's, it's one of, I, I just like that setting. And I like it because with a large build plate like this, chances are you've got some areas of the build plate that work better than others to put down a first layer. Um, and so focusing everything on the center of the build plate enables you to focus on getting that first layer right within the center, um, which gives you your best chance of printing. So, I use that every time I always have objects in the center to start with, unless I have more than one object, obviously. <clears throat> okay. So then we have scaling and scaling lets you make things bigger or smaller, and you can use uniform scaling. If you have something that, you know, you just want, um, to uniform, uniformly be bigger or smaller. So if I drag one of these corners, you'll see that it's uniformly scaling the whole object up to the limits of the machine. Um, and if I don't want uniform scaling, so maybe I put this back to hundred percent, I can turn that off and then I can just grab one axis and change it. And a little tip or trick with that is, um, you know, I've got this extrusion. I know because I designed it that it's 19 and a half inches long. And so if I, you know, say wanted this thing to be, I don't know, eight inches long, what I can do is just a little bit of math. I could do eight divided by. 19.5 that means eight inches is 41 percent of 19 and a half um, so then just real quick i'll times this by 100 that gives me my actual percentage and then i can copy and paste 
over in the Z axis there, um, that percentage. And now when I print this, it should be eight inches uh, tall, not 19 and a half inches tall. So for things that um, you know are uniform, but you just want to change the length of it, um, you can use scaling for that. Um, the layout, and uh, I'll just jump down here to scene painting. I haven't messed around with either of these, so um, I couldn't really give you clues on how to use those tools. Uh, but you do have the other two tools here, cut and painting. Um, I don't use cutting. I would do this in on shape rather than doing it here, but I'll show you what it does. And then paint on supports, I use these all the time. I'll show you that as well here in a second. So cutting is exactly what you think it's going to be. It, you hit the button, it generates a, a plane on the Z axis, and you can move it up, up and down that plane, and then you can perform a cut. And it just takes your one object and turns it into two. So, and then if you deselect, you can move those independently. Um, the reason I don't use this is because you could also do this in AutoCAD. And if you do it in AutoCAD, you can engineer in uh, alignment tools, and you could also engineer a lip uh, with a receiving end um, that makes more surface area for whatever agent you're going to use to bond these two halves together, like super glue. Um, you can engineer this so you have maximum surface area and alignment. So why would you just do a cut when you can do that? Uh, but if you're not using AutoCAD and you're just, you know, out there on Thingiverse or printables and uh, whatever other websites are out there and you're just finding objects and then you find one and it's too big for your build plate, it's a good way to, um, you know, solve that problem. And the other thing I'll just point out is you notice it cuts on the Z axis. So, well, what if I wanted to cut this, this direction? Um, you could just put the thing down on the build plate that way, hit cut, and then, and then there you go. You can put this wherever you want perform your cut and now I've got this thing split the other direction and then I could stand it back up if I wanted to really doesn't matter so kind of cool um okay so we'll hit control z if you didn't know about control z that's undo shortcut um it's a windows thing and the slicer supports it so I hit that enough times that I got back to where I was and if I hit it one more time, we should be 19 and a half inches again, or there you go. All right, so paint on supports. Um, this particular model doesn't require supports. So actually let me, um, let me just delete it and I'll import um, this little three-way joint uh, that is for that extr extrusion. And by the way, uh, what I'm showing here, these are available in printables. Um, I'll try to remember to put a link to them in the description. And if I don't, just uh, comment and I'll make sure I go back and do that. So um, when I print these three-way these three-way elbows, uh, I print them in this orientation. So I want that middle joint to be down. And, um, and the reason I do this is because I want these three faces to be the same and uniform because these are the faces that you're going to see when you're looking at um, the printer stand that I'm that I'm currently printing. Um, and um, anyway, to do any type of printing with this model, I need supports because I have portions of the model that overhang, um, and anything that overhang needs a support. So you can't print in thin air. Um, well, I shouldn't say anything. Anything that's an angle over 50 degrees needs a support. So like, for example, this line right here, as it builds up, this is 45 degrees to the build plate. Um, it should be capable of doing that just fine, but you'll see like points here, like this point, there would be nothing here. It, you know, the slicer, if I go ahead and I'll just do no supports and I'm just doing this to make it fast to slice. But um, you'll see here if I if I slice it and then I come down and I get to that layer right here, the printer, when it gets to this layer, it would be printing this section and this section in midair and it can't do that. <laughs> How can it start this piece and then ultimately bring it back to here starting from midair? So it needs support. So you're going to have models that need supports. It's, it's going to happen all the time. Uh, no big deal, but you have the options. So you can go into your slicer settings 
and you can go into support material and you can define the style of support and um, and whether or not the support gets generated. So somewhere in here, ah, generate support material. And then, um, and then down here I can do organic, snug or grid. And I would just encourage you to play around with these. I think generally speaking, organic is kind of the go-to support, um, but I'll use grid or snug anytime I have large flat overhangs. Um, so that's, that's kind of my rule of thumb. If I've got a large flat surface that needs support underneath it, I'll typically use one of those two, not all the time, but typically, and you just, it's one of those things you got to build a feel for, um, so that you can make, uh, you know, the right decision in the right moments. Generally speaking though, like I said, organic supports is probably the go-to. Um, so if you're only going to choose one to start with, I would choose organic. I'll go through these settings a little bit later, but. Anyway, so we've got setting uh, supports turned on. I'll go ahead and um, put supports on the build plate only. Um, if you choose everywhere, it's gonna put supports sometimes starting on the material. And I notice also uh, sometimes even when you have on build plate only chosen, it may put supports in places um, that start on your model, not the build plate. I'm not sure why that is, if that's a bug or, or what, but, um, but just worth noting. So, okay, the model's done here and you can see it generated all the supports that I need for all the overhangs, um, both inside, outside, up and down. And, um, and you can see here, it estimates 246 uh, grams of filament and 12 and a half hours of print time. Um, that is using auto-generated supports. Now, I never, almost never, use auto-generated supports. I use supports for enforcers only, which uses um, whatever supports are defined by paint on supports. And to paint on my supports, I typically do automatic painting. Automatic painting, uh, to the best of my understanding, is going to put a support anywhere that the angle exceeds, uh, where is it at? Um, ba, 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 ba. anywhere that the angle exceeds this overhang threshold. Um, so 50 degrees is where it's set to. And so it's going to put a little paint mark on all of those. And by using automatic painting on brush on supports, if I now censor this with enforcers only selected, um, it's just more efficient. So first of all, you can kind of notice that it's slicing a little bit faster. We're now only using 218 grams of filament and we knocked two hours and two minutes off our print time. Couldn't tell you why, uh, in theory, both should operate the same way, the automatic paint and support for build plates only, but it doesn't. So there's a tip for you. Okay, so that's kind of the lay of the land. Um, that's that's pretty much everything that I mess with um, in the slicer uh, on a regular basis as far as, you know, tools. Um, so let's go into some settings. So to start with, we'll, we'll just go through print settings here. And um, I'm gonna show you, like I mentioned earlier, a montage of all of my settings. So I'll just focus on what I think you need to know. All right, so under layers and perimeters, first things first, um, you have your first layer height and then you have your general layer height. Typically speaking, you want your general layer height to be half of the nozzle diameter. Um, so your nozzle di diameter out of the box for a Cobra 2 Max is 0.4 millimeters. So you start with 0.2 millimeter layer height. Now, the smaller you make the layer height, and there is a point of diminishing returns for this, um, the more detailed the print can be, um, basically it just means that each layer is a little bit smaller, therefore your layer lines are smaller. Um, conversely, uh, or, you know, adversely, if you lower your layer height, you're going to increase your printing time because it's going to take more layers uh, to print the same object. So I find that 0.2 millimeters is 
a great balance of speed and, um, you know, detail. Uh, I've seen some settings from any cubic that have this set to 0.16. I didn't notice any type of improvement um, in any of the things I was printing in quality. So I went back to 0.2 millimeters and, you know, eventually I plan on changing out my nozzles, um, messing around with 0.6 and 0.8 millimeter nozzles. Um, so, you know, if I'm at 0.6, I'll start at 0.3 layer height, so on and so forth. Um, your first layer height, uh, you want this to be, um, as small as your printer is capable of producing a good first layer, in my opinion. And the reason I say that is the first layer is basically the foundation for the building that is whatever you're printing. And the more accurate and um, consistent that first layer is, the more likely your print is to succeed and the more likely that print is to have high quality. Now, there's other factors that are going to go into that, like, um, you know, wobble, loose belts, um, not being on a solid foundation to begin with, you know, sitting on a table that's going to allow the printer to shake itself crazy while it's printing. But the first layer height is um, your first tool for kind of setting up your print for success. And um, 0.28 seems to be a really nice balance uh, between layer height depth and, um, and being able to compensate for the inconsistencies that are on the build plate itself. So basically making a larger first layer height enables you to kind of compensate for a build plate that isn't perfect. Um, but if you have a more perfect build plate, you can go all the way down to your layer height um, on your first layer. And um, I have been printing at a 0.2 millimeter first layer uh, on both of my printers after installing silicon spacers and doing um, some bed flattening. Um, and I've been able to do that, but I will tell you, I have to be way more diligent with checking and adjusting the Z offset over time, the smaller I make the first layer. So 0.28 seems to be a good middle ground. You can see, if you highlight over 0.35 is what the slicer recommends. Um, and I'll just say uh, everything that's in the recommendations of the slicer, none of it matches um, the profiles for the AnyCubic Mac, Cobra 2 Max that AnyCubic puts out there. So I don't know if there's a disconnect for who's working on the software side of the house versus the recommendations or what. It doesn't make sense to me. All of these default values should be what they want you to use out of the box, in my opinion, and they don't seem to be. So I think these are values that came from Prusa, where this slicer was derived from, but I don't really know. All right, um, perimeters. So when you have an object and you slice it, so let's just um, go back to the G-code preview. So when you slice an object, you can see here, if I zoom in, it's gonna create two perimeters on the exterior uh, and then two perimeters on the interior. So um, that's what your perimeters are. And, um, and yeah, so two I think is the minimum and I've been using two pretty much um, exclusively for this particular project I'm working on. And the reason is I'm built, I'm printing some really large parts and I'm trying to get as many of those parts as I can out of a single spool of filament. And especially that 19 and a half inch extrusion um, set with two perimeters and 3% infill, I can print two of them uh, on a single spool of filament. And, um, and so that's why uh, I think generally speaking, I would recommend three perimeters that just gives you more separation between the finished exterior of your part and the infill um, that, um, that helps with quality. Um, then you have your shells. So these are your top and bottom layers. So anything that's a flat surface on the bottom, anything that's a flat surface on the top, um, you get three layers on the bottom, four on the top. I think these were the defaults and this is pretty much what I've been running with. So, um, it makes sense that you would need less solid layers on the bottom because the bottom is in contact with the build plate and therefore, um, 
your imprint of the build plate is going to be the quality of the bottom. So you don't need additional layers to help with quality. Uh, but on the top, you're going to typically have, um, you know, areas that have to be bridged. So your first top layer is basically a bridge that's spanning these gaps across infill. And, um, and then it takes a couple layers to get that from a rough bridge to a smooth finish. So that's why you got the extra layer there. And I've never found a need to change this, so I haven't. Um, I'll also say, you know, max minimum shell thickness. Um, I, this setting, I believe, will exceed the layers if need be to maintain this thickness. And this thickness is determined by your layer height. So I've got my layer height set to 0.2 millimeters. So it would take three layers to achieve 0.6 millimeters of thickness. Um, so this should really never kick in, but that's what I believe that setting is. Um, there's some quality settings in here. I haven't really found any of these to be particularly useful. Um, I was having some issues and actually let me go ahead and deselect this. Um, I was having some issues with organic supports getting knocked off my build plate, um, particularly with this model. So uh, with this three-way um, uh, socket or, or joint, um, every time that I tried to run this print, you know, somewhere like right about here, I would start to see some of these get knocked off. And then pretty much any time the branch gets to a thin point, you run the risk of the nozzle hitting that branch and knocking that, um, that support off. And you may think, well, hell, it shouldn't do that. It's all the same amount of layers. They're all the same layer thickness. But you got to think about thermodynamics a little bit. Um, you know, plastics expand and contract. Anything expands and contracts as it gets hot and then cold. And um, the thinner and smaller a piece is, the more thermal expansion is going to play a role in it warping or changing its shape over time. Um, and so just, you know, think about that nozzle laying that thing down, then it goes and does a bunch of other layers, and then it comes back to that. By the time it's done, it's cooled, it's warped a little bit. It doesn't take much for it to warp enough that that nozzle can hit it. So all that is to just say that avoid avoiding crossing curled overhangs, I believe is supposed to detect uh, in the slicer where it gets to these points that, you know, could have warping or could have um, potentially put itself in the way of the nozzle. And it tries to avoid that, but it doesn't seem to be successful. So let me just save that setting. So what I found as a solution for that is using retraction. So if I go into the printer um, and I come down here, uh, what I did is I, I enabled a Z lift um, and I've got it at 0.8 millimeters uh, with a retraction of two millimeters. And basically what this is doing is it's saying anytime you're crossing another piece, um, rather than just moving from here to here, which enables the chance for that nozzle to then collide and cause that piece to snap, it's going to lift the nozzle up, go over, and then come back down on top of this piece and then start printing. And consider the fact that that nozzle is set to print temperature. When it comes back down, even if this is higher than this area, it'll melt itself down into the plastic and then continue to print with no issues at all. Um, no issues at all, but there could be an issue. And I'll just say Z hop, what that does is it enables um, or increases the chance of stringing. So if you can think about that nozzle pulling up, it's got molten plastic that was just laid down and molten plastic still in the nozzle. So when it pulls up, it's gonna naturally pull a little bit of that plastic up and create a string. If you've ever used a hot glue gun, it's kind of the same principle. You lay down some hot glue and then you pick up the hot glue gun and you get a string of hot glue that follows the glue gun. And so where's that gonna go? That string is gonna come over here and then it's gonna come back down. And so then you'll potentially have a string from here to here. Um, retraction is supposed to help with that. So basically uh, what it's doing is before the nozzle lifts up, it's sucking the filament up into the nozzle by in this case, uh, two millimeters. So it'll suck up two millimeters of filament, then move the nozzle, come back down, and then push that two millimeters of, of filament back out before it starts printing again. Um, you have to be careful, though, with retraction 
because too much retraction, you can get enough molten filament sucked up so fast that it gets to a, a point in the print head where it shouldn't be molten. It deforms and then the extruder is not capable of pushing that back out the nozzle. Um, I've, I've had some experiences with clogged nozzles and hot ends on both Cobra 2 Maxes. As a matter of fact, that's been a, um, a pretty frequent issue that I'm intending to make another video about. Um, I don't know if it was retraction or not, but I've lowered my retraction from the five millimeters I initially started with. Five millimeters came from a, a YouTube recommendation. Um, just to try and combat that from being a possible cause of um, the the head getting clogged, and um, and the reason the reason I went to this setting is because I set this retraction on one printer to five millimeters, and I set it on the other um, to the default slicer setting of two millimeters, um, and that one printer seemed to have a higher occurrence of clogged nozzles. Now that higher occurrence is you know, three clog nozzles out of probably a month's worth of printing time um, versus one clog nozzle in the other machine, but that could also just be um, luck of the draw. So who knows? Uh, I would say though, um, based on what I've seen on YouTube videos, you don't want this to be higher than seven millimeters. Seven millimeters seems to be the, the, the threshold of your sucking filament way too high up into the nozzle. That's just based on what I've seen in YouTube, though. I don't have a real reason for that. So, okay. Um, so layer back to layers and perimeter. Um, so none of these settings have seemed to do too much, except maybe thick bridges. So bridging is anytime the nozzle is dragging filament across a gap. Um, and, um, and so like, if you're looking at this wall here, if this was a top layer, as a matter of fact, let's just go to the top layers. So here's the top layer. So if I come down, you'll see that it goes from being hollow here to a bridge layer and the bridge layer is color coded blue. You can see over here, this is bridge infill. And so basically what's going to happen here is it's going to move the print head at the bridge speed. It's going to turn the fan on 100%. Um, and it's going to try and cool this filament as rapidly as it can as it's pulling the nozzle to make it rigid enough to bridge the gap. And so, um, yeah, so thick bridges just means making this filament thicker, which there are times where you may want that. And a good example is um, I made a 3D printed hinge uh, that was print in place. And so being print in place means that the pin for the hinge is being printed while the rest of the hinge is being printed. So the pin is a bridge. The very first layer of the pin is a bridge. And um, by making that thicker, it seemed to be more strong and it also seemed to be less um, stranded after the fact. When you turn in the hinge, it didn't sound crunchy, it sounded solid. So um, I think that helped for that. But generally speaking, thick bridges can also impact the quality of that top layer. And I think that's why it's deselected by default, or no, I guess it's, it was deselected by default uh, per any Cubix uh, profile that they sent, I believe but um looks like the slicer wants it enabled so i'll probably roll with it being enabled for a while and see how that pans out um other things i've tried in here is um i tried avoid crossing perimeters um it just makes the nozzle take more time to go from layer to layer it tries to uh, minimize um moving from one area to another without crossing a perimeter um it I tried this to solve the problem of organic supports getting knocked off. Again, nothing solved that problem other than Z hop for me. And um, based on what I've seen in a lot of the Facebook groups and some of the forums, um, that seems to be consistent with other people's experience. Um, seam. So anytime you print something, you're going to have a seam, um, the nozzle as it's um, doing its thing. So if we um, go back to code preview,
So anytime the nozzle is doing its thing, so we go down to a particular layer height, then you can go and actually see the path that the nozzle is taking. So it's going to draw all this out and then it ends wherever, wherever that's at. Where's that at? Uh, so you can see the nozzles here. So it ends somewhere over here. Um, when it goes up to that next layer, if the seams are aligned, it's going to start in that same spot. So if we go back to the start, so it's going to start where it ended and then it's going to draw all the lines. And then it's going to move up to the next layer and it will start in that same spot. Well, maybe not. In this case, it's starting on the organic supports, but, um, uh, but that's the concept. So everywhere the nozzle starts and stops per part, I guess, um, it's, it's doing that in the same spot. And then what you see is if, you know, you'll have potentially a, a line in that spot where um, the filament was, you know, the dried cool filament was meeting the hot molten filament every layer change. And so you may want that to be aligned for easy cleanup. You may want it to be random, put those seams all over the place. Um, I believe that's also what the paint on seams features is for. So you can kind of define where that seam is going to take place. Um, but again, I haven't really played around with that too much. Uh, it really hasn't been that big of an issue for me. Um, some of this other stuff, these are just default settings that I've been running with that I haven't really changed. Um, this setting is pretty cool, fuzzy skin. Um, this is going to basically, um, instead of doing a straight perimeter, so if this, um, if this perimeter wall was straight, instead of just drawing a straight line, it's basically going to draw, draw a zigzag line. Um, and then it offsets those zigzags layer to layer. So it kind of creates this um, appearance of a textured finish. Um, and the skin thickness is basically how far in and out of that line is the nozzle allowed to go. And the fuzzy skin point distance is how many zigzags is it making for the same length of line. So a longer one might look like this and a shorter one might look like this. So kind of neat. Um, I use this on a... You know, I'm a Baltimore guy, so I printed up in the playoffs some uh, some Raven figures, and I was handing them out to some friends. And I put fuzzy skin on those things, and once I put fuzzy skin on it, it was really, really a cool texture. It, it really made it look like um, feathers, and you couldn't see any layer lines after that, but it's definitely not something you're probably going to want to use on every single print, depending on what you're printing. Okay, uh, infill. Um, so infill is... You know, this is taking the volume that's inside of a shape and instead of making it solid, we're making it a little bit hollow and we're using geometry to maintain strength. And um, so infill is always a percentage, a pattern, and um, in the rest of the settings I, I've never really messed with. So you can see at 3% infill, uh, if I go back again to the G review, and I apologize for changing back and forth, takes quite a bit, even on a pretty powerful computer. Um, but you'll see down here, um, this red is your infill, and this is a gyroid pattern. So it's kind of um, like oscillating and it's it's taking kind of like an oval and it's, uh, it's turning it and twisting it as it comes up. Uh, and gyroid is my favorite infill so far that I've tried. It is a consistent infill pattern, meaning um, it doesn't change the density from bottom to top. I'll talk about that a little more in a second. And it seems to provide some of the best finishes, even from only two perimeters, with the most strength um, of everything that I've tried. I'm not saying it's the end-all be-all or it's the one you should use, but it's the one I use and it's the one I've been using pretty much exclusively. Um, if I increase the density, say take that up to 20% and then I slice you'll see that it just makes the pattern smaller um, thus more frequent thus uh, stronger so it's going to use more filament and it's going to put it in more places and you may think um, these are big parts and obviously I'm building something with joinery here and um, I need that strength but there's a reason these parts are hollow I intend to um, once it's assembled uh, pour concrete into the hollow cavity and I'm going to be using concrete for the strength. 
So I don't really care about the strength of the part. It's really just cosmetic um, and a form, if you will. So that's why the density is what it is. Uh, but you can also see just a better example of what that gyroid pattern is. Um, and again, it's I find it to be the best combination of strength and, um, and quality of print. Um, another setting that I use somewhat often is adaptive cubic. Um, and what adaptive cubic is going to do, this is really a setting for I need support at the top of my print for the top layers. So I've got bridging gaps that need to be bridged at the top. So I need to have support there for it to bridge across, but I want to minimize the use of infill. So as the print gets down to the base, uh, the pattern and the gyro or the, the cubes are going to get bigger. And in this particular model, you're not really seeing a good example of that, but that's, that's the concept. So if this was just a big cube, you would see very wide cubes at the bottom and the cubes would get smaller towards the top when it gets to the point where it has a large flat surface that needs bridge layers on top. Um, but again, this, this model is really just not a good example of adaptive cubic, but that's the concept. So I'm not using the infill for strength necessarily. I'm using it uh, to be able to produce those top layers and I want to minimize the use of the infill. So that's, that's what adaptive cubic is for. Um, some of these other ones like triangles, uh, grid, you know, they have their places. Um, I would just try them, but like I said, I, I almost exclusively use gyroid and I'm just going to put my info percentage back. Uh, so I don't forget on the next print. Um, a couple other things in here. So ironing, um, to the best of my understanding, and I've never used it, but what this is doing is on your top layers, it's using the nozzle without any extrusion. So it's, it's just using the hot nozzle to run over the top layer, um, to most literally iron out that surface. And so it can basically get rid of, um, the lines in that top layer. Again, I've never used it. That's my understanding of the concept. And, uh, if you're into woodworking or anything, it's kind of like, to the best of my understanding, it's kind of like taking a, um, like a glue up for a tabletop and using a, uh, a router with a jig, uh, to flatten that surface. You're, you're putting the router on a sled and you're moving the router back and forth, uh, taking little chunks out at a time, um, to make it perfectly flat. And I think that's kind of the same thing ironing is trying to achieve. Um, and then the rest of these settings, I, again, I, I haven't really messed with, with really any of these. So we'll just move on. Um, skirts and brim. So a skirt is just putting basically a perimeter around the outside of the object. And you can determine how far away from the object it is, as well as how many, um, how many skirts and how high the skirt goes. I don't know why you would want more than one layer, but uh, where I find skirts useful is to basically, um, if you're going to watch your first layer go down, which I typically do, because that's you usually know right away if the print's going to be successful or high chance of failure. Um, you can use the skirt to get a gauge of whether or not your Z offset is set appropriately. If the layer of, you know, if the nozzle is either too close or too far away from the print bed on that first layer. And what I do is I use um, 3D printed scrapers. So, um, I use, uh, this guy, uh, this little bamboo lab scraper. I think it was either Thingiverse or printables. Uh, by the way, I usually print these at 125% uniformly, 125%. Uh, I guess maybe I had to turn that on first. Um, but I'll use this and I'll take the little tip and I'll just drag it over the skirt as it's getting laid down. And, um, you know, it's something you'll have to develop a feel for, but it's really, um, you know, I'm, I'm pushing hard enough that, um, pushing hard enough that it, if it's loose on the print, you're going to, you're going to see the skirt move, but not so hard that I feel like it, you know, there's, the first layer is only going to adhere so much to the print bed and you can't expect it to adhere more than that. So I'm scraping it just enough that I feel like that's strong enough that it's not going to come off the print bed. Um, but solid enough. Uh, maybe you get the point. So 
So that's what I use skirts for. And, um, you know, I'll usually do a single skirt loop uh, a few millimeters away from the object because I don't want it to get glued to the object effectively. Um, brims are for, um, you know, basically you're putting skirts, but around the perimeter of the object in contact with the object. And so if I do a brim here and I select so this, this little scraper, which I would not typically print with a brim, um, you can see I got my one skirt and then I've got a brim that is six millimeters wide. Where you may want a brim though, is maybe you print this object and you find this corner curls up or, um, you know, maybe it's a very narrow, um, object, you know, very thin object in contact with the build plate you use the brims for more build plate adhesion uh, and keep large flat objects from curling. Uh, you can also combat curling with temperatures, but, um, but a brim is a good easy fix. So this object I wouldn't, that other object I was showing, I would use a brim because there's only three really small contact points that are adhering to the build plate. So the brim just gives it more surface area. Um, and then your brim separation gap is most literally that it's how far away from the object. So if I go down to the first layer here, you can see the gap from the, the perimeter to the brim that is, as I defined it, 0.15. And if I make that bigger, uh, so maybe I'll just go to crazy 0.3 and slicer it, you'll see the gap gets bigger. Um, so what I'm trying to achieve here with 0.15 is as that layer goes down, it squishes the filament, the filament squeezes out. And, um, and so I want the brim to be in contact with the perimeter, but not stout contact with, I don't want it to be the same as a perimeter. I want that brim to be able to snap off and peel off with relative ease. And, uh, for me anyway, 0.15 seems to be the sweet spot. So, um, I've gone as much as 0.2 and that, typically works too when your nozzle set on a little bit of the lower side of good. Um, 0.15 can be a little too much if your nozzles on the higher side of good um, on that first layer, but 0.15 seems to be a sweet spot for me. And I, six millimeters is an arbitrary number that just feels right for a lot of the models that I'm working with where I add a brim. Um, and then also just note, if you're doing a brim, you don't necessarily need a skirt um, to do that, that check, you can use the brim. Um, and if you do find that, you know, your Z offsets way too high or too low, you can either really quickly adjust it and, you know, hope that you got it good, or you can stop that print and then immediately, you know, use a scraper, scrape it off and then immediately restart it. Um, and then check it again. That's, that's more or less my go-to move. Um, I'll stop and restart the print. Um, support material. So these are, uh, we already kind of covered. Um, so organic supports creates that tree like structure. It's kind of the best overall, uh, support material. Um, generally speaking, it's efficient use of material, um, with quicker print times than grid or snug typically are, but that's depends on what you're printing and what the support requirements are. So again, if it's something that's got like a large flat overhang, like, um, like maybe, uh, maybe let's get rid of this object so maybe if i was bringing in that same um three-way and i was printing it in this orientation rather than the one i chose you know here you can see a large flat overhang and if you did this with organic supports it would be functional but it may not be a higher it would be a lower quality first layer for that overhang than say a grid or a snug grid would be. Um, and the difference that I can tell in how they generate between our, a snug and a normal grid is that a snug seems to try and suck the support material as close to the build plate as possible uh, versus um, just a liberal use of support material. So you can see there, there's, there's the snug support and it gets to this point where, yeah, it's just printing what it needs. And then, um, and then if we come in here and then we do a grid. Ah, okay, so that's the difference. So snug is just a, a, a more sparse use, but you can see it, grid does a little bit more support material. Um, 
And then of course, if we go in and we do organic, it can still do it, no problem. But, um, but I just find that for large flat overhangs, it doesn't produce quite the same quality of print that um, snugger tree supports would. And you can kind of see, you know, there's inconsistency with the contact points, which I think is why. So it's, it's drawing those little things and it draws a little line and it tries to, on top of these, print that layer. So still works, still good. I've done plenty of this uh, organic support with flat overhangs, but, um, but you get the idea. Okay, um, pattern spacing. So this is um, basically uh, for the, the grid supports, it's, um, how far, how big are the grid blocks? So um, two and a half millimeter cubes is basically what you're gonna create with two and a half millimeter pattern spacer spacing, at least that's my understanding of it. And then interface layers is um, before the object begins to print, how many um, of, let's just go back to um, G code preview, how many interface layers is it going to print? So right, here these dark green layers those are the interface layers so one two three and i find that three interface layers the more interface layers you do the easier the support is or the more likely the support is to break off cleanly um, if you do fewer support layers interface layers then you may have these branches snapping off one at a time um, is kind of been my experience so it also is one of those things where, you know, depends on how many layers the supports are going to be on. Uh, if generally, like on this model, I only have a couple different layers for support interface layers are getting put down. Um, it's not really going to impact your print time all that much to add one additional interface interface layer. So, um, and then I always just make top the same as bottom. Um, supports on build plate only. Uh, what that means is that it's not going to attempt to draw any supports that begin on my material. So you can see like right here, um, it's curving around and then coming in where this piece needs. Um, and it's, it's coming from the outside in, it's not starting here. Uh, whereas if I did supports everywhere in this particular piece, I'm not sure if it will or won't. With organic supports, I find that it often tries to go uh, on the build plate only. Uh, now, so it, so it does. So yeah, supports everywhere. Instead of coming from the build plate to start my support, it's starting on my piece, uh, which in my experience is just harder to clean up after the fact because you have two contact points with that support versus just a build plate contact support point and then a point where it's doing the support. So I try to always support on build plate only or support enforces only whenever I'm using supports. Can't always avoid it. There's certain models that, you know, it's going to be what it's going to be, but, um, but that's, that's what that's about. Um, X, Y separation. This is something I changed. So 300%, what it means is as it's generating those supports, um, how far away does the support have to be from the part that you're printing. So if we go to our G code preview and we go down to that first layer, 300% is three layer lines away from the object or three, not necessarily layer lines, but um, yeah, I guess it wouldn't be layer lines because that'd be a lot bigger than that. But it's a percentage that it's moving away from the object and 300% I started at 100, then I started at 150, and then I just doubled that to 300%. And I stopped having problems with the base of the supports not, or basically sticking to the part. It was also before I had my first layers dialed in, so it's a good chance I don't need quite that much separation now. But the only downside I can really see to this is it just takes a hair longer for the nozzle to get to the point where it's starting to print that, um, support material, I can't really find any other downsides to that. So that's just leaving it there until I have a reason to change it. Um, everything else in here is pretty much default. I haven't changed anything there. 
Um, speed is a big one. So this is going to dictate the movement speeds for the various layer types. And, and um, just to share with you my thoughts and where I ended up settling. Um, so I'm doing my perimeters currently at 230 millimeters per second. Um, it's pretty fast and pretty accurate at that speed. Um, small and external perimeters, I'm slowing it down just to get more resolution and, and more accuracy. Um, I chose these arbitrary numbers just based on looking at what the slicer recommends for each setting. So it recommended 60 millimeters per second for speed and 15 millimeters per second um, for the small perimeter. So my 40% is just a re reflection of a little intuition um, based on the recommendations. Maybe the math checks out that it's the same difference, but I'm not sure. Um, and um, I haven't had real calls to adjust these yet, but at some point in the not too distant future, um, I plan on really trying to dive into tuning all of these settings um, to basically get maximum print quality with, um, with maximum speed. And I will tell you also, you may have an inclination to want to just go as fast as possible, but if that's your inclination, you're going to waste a lot of filament chances are because, um, what I'm learning is slow and steady wins the race with 3d printing. Um, I will often start a print and then go put the printer in the stable mode, which reduces all of these speeds even further. Um, just to have a time trade off for success rate. Uh, so yeah. That's where I'm at. And I'm basically just, as I have failures, I'm either addressing mechanical issues with the printer, you know, tightening, loosening, whatever, uh, or I'm coming here and adjusting speeds. So, and so far I've just been kind of, this is my starting point, And then I uniformly bring everything down or up from there. Uh, but I want to get more granular in the future and maybe I'll make a video about that at some point. Um, the other thing is, and I think, your max print speed, when you're referencing percentages, these are a percentage of the max print speed. I believe that's, that's how that's done. I'm not hundred percent, but for example, here, support material interface. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and change this to 233 millimeters per second, because I don't want that going at 300 millimeters per second, if that holds true. Um, so, okay. Uh, and actually, come to think of it, support material interfaces I've had issue with. So it is potentially that it was going too fast and maybe that was my problem. Um, travel for non-print speed moves. So this is just how fast is the nozzle going to move when it's not laying down filament. So a little bit faster is fine in my opinion. Um, your first layer speed, this is something I changed. So down to 60 millimeters per second. Again, I'm just kind of using the default value versus some intuition and also considering that the first layer is such a small portion of the total print time, but such a critical piece to success or failure of the print. And so why not slow this down to a, um, to effectively a snail's pace. So it gives it the best chance of adhering and not having errors before that next layer goes down. It's a lot easier to put a layer of plastic on a layer of plastic than it is to put a layer of plastic on a glass surface. So that's the theory. All right, acceleration control. Um, these are way crazy out of the factory if you're using the recommended settings from any cubic. Uh, most of these are set to like 10,000 millimeters per second. Um, and this is basically to the, to the best of my understanding during non-print moves, how fast can the um, motors try to drive? And um, I went down to 5,000 millimeters per second. I didn't see a giant change in the recommended print times or the estimated print times, um, but I have just experienced much higher success rates having changed these settings. So that's where I'm living. And this 5,000 comes from what people recommend uh, for the printer settings that I'll get to in a second here. Um, okay. Under advanced, let's see, extrusion widths. So to the best of my understanding, and I could be completely wrong about this, this is, um, telling the printer how much filament to push through that nozzle 
uh, to squeeze to this width. Now, these are not going to be dimensionally accurate, chances are, but a bigger number means squeeze more filament and a smaller number means squeeze less filament. So, yeah. Um, how I got to these numbers was really, again, it was kind of like a little bit of intuition matched with what the slicer shows as recommended numbers. Um, and you can see here, like it says, otherwise 1.125 times the nozzle diameter. And so that's where, you know, the math came from for these settings. And so far these settings have been good. Um, I kind of followed these off of something. I, I don't even remember where I saw it, but I saw somebody have these exact same settings with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, uh, or at least similar. And, and I kind of ran with it because I was getting, um, first layers where, uh, adjusting the Z offset could not get the lines to connect and, um, and making the extrusion width a little bit wider solved that problem. Uh, so yeah. Um, overlap flow, all these other things I've never really messed around with. Um, so that's that, um, filament settings. Uh, so, you know, there's a couple things here. Um, extrusion multiplier, this is kind of your correction. If, you know, if you find that you go to your printer and you turn the hot end on and you extrude hundred millimeters of filament and it's actually pulling, you know, 99 millimeters or 101 millimeters or even more egregious than that. You can do the math on what that difference in percentage is and you can apply that here and it won't fix hitting the extrude 100 millimeters at the printer uh, but it will correct for it when it's slicing up your g-code and putting your prints down on one um on the print bed at least that's my understanding um 0.98 was my default and um and i did notice that when i extrude 100 millimeters uh, that I'm getting slightly over 100 millimeters uh, at my printer as measured by basically what I did is I, I took a piece of string, I uh, cut it to exactly 100 millimeters as measured by calipers, and then I would put the piece of string against the um, filament extrusion sensor. I would stretch it out and then put a little piece of tape at the end of the string on the filament. Um, and actually come to think of it, I set it to 120 millimeters, uh, for fear that the tape would get sucked into the, um, into the, um, filament sensor. So put it at 120 millimeters, extrude hundred millimeters. And then I measure what's left from the tape to the, um, filament sensor. And I was getting, uh, slightly less than 20 millimeters that I expected. If it was exactly hundred, I should have exactly 20 millimeters left. Um, so that just left me to want to keep this at the 0.98 that it came from the factory settings. Um, and I haven't really checked it, nor have I looked into a way to check, is that accurate, but it feels fine. So leave it as is, uh, pressure advance is the other thing you may want to change. Um, there's a test built into the slicer. If you hit this little, uh, pressure advance button and hit okay. Uh, oh, nah, actually, I didn't want to save that, so let's just pull that back out. Just discard everything. Okay, so what you do is you print this um, as is. There aren't, you'll notice there's no slicer settings, and that's because um, it's modifying the G code in a way that you can't do with the slicer. Uh, what it's doing is it's, it's drawing a line with no pressure advance, and then it's incrementally adding pressure advance all the way up to 0.096. Um, and what you do is you print this, um, you look at the lines and you're looking for the most consistent line. So you're going to see probably at the bottom, the lines start off thick, they get thin and then they get thick again. And that thin spot may wave a little bit throughout here. Um, but eventually you should find a line somewhere around 0.05 typically, uh, that is perfect or close to perfect. Um, you may not get perfect. Um, so for example, if this line up here was the best line, 0.064 would become my pressure advanced setting. Um, and what that's doing is it's, it's changing, uh, the speed and the number of steps that the extruder is using based on the start of laying down filament, 
uh, and the end of laying down filament. So basically it's, it's putting down filament and then it's either increasing in speed or decreasing in speed to cut, keep up with the thickness of the line. Then when this is done, you're going to use your scraper and you're going to pop all these up and you're going to curse like hell because it's going to make a complete mess everywhere. These things are going to fly all over the place. You'll be finding little zeros and dots uh, and numbers um, for weeks if you don't find a way to mitigate that. Um, I have seen other pressure advanced tests that have all of these numbers on a flat layer first, uh, which seems ideal. Um, I've seen that in YouTube videos. I don't know where to get the G code for it. So this is what I use. Um, but I found that, um, you know, for me, uh, I've got two Cobra twos. I try to, I'm trying to maintain the same settings across both machines and make the mechanical adjustments required at the machines to get them consistent rather than using settings in the slicer. Um, my thought process is um, how can I ever get the machine dialed in perfect if I'm constantly using the slicer to correct problems? Um, and I'm trying to really do my best to learn how these machines work and, and understand them so I want to make as many adjustments at the machine itself than in software to fix problems. Um, anyway, uh, density, cost, and weight. These just go into, I believe, the, the calculations for how much filament you're using and all that fun stuff. But I don't think they're used in the printing process. And then uh, nozzle temperature. Um, I've seen in a lot of the YouTube videos I've watched that the, um, the nozzle temperature is typically the same most people are using from first layer to other layers. Uh, with the Anycubix uh, settings, I think it was 215 to 210 over here. I, I know they were different. Um, I chose 205 degrees because the majority of the PLA that I've been using has either a range of 190 to 230 or a range of 200 to 210 degrees. And um, by doing 205 right in the middle, it just seems like a logical middle ground. And I found that, you know, printing closer to that bottom 190, 200 degrees um, definitely makes the prints look a little dry and creates questionable adhesion in the layer lines. And having the print temperature too high, um, it just it creates a lot of oozing and it makes it harder to get consistent layers. Um, and you also get a lot of stringing uh, when you have higher temperature. So 205 um, is actually a little higher than I've been printing at. I've been printing at 200 degrees, but um, I'm just testing um, a little bit of strength fear theory in that. So uh, cooling, I've never made um, any adjustments to this that I can think of. Um, so these are all effectively the stock settings. Um, same thing for advanced and same thing for uh, filament retraction. Um, I did enable a retraction setting, but I did it in the printer. Uh, so not, not the filament. You may want to do it in the filament settings if you're using multiple materials and you find that one filament needs Z lift and retraction versus a different type of filament or a different brand of filament potentially. Um, so I'm glad that they have the setting in both both places versus universal for the printer setting. <clears throat> okay. Um, also, just while we're here, um, this plus icon, um, this is how you save. So if you make a change, hit plus, hit OK. Um, or if you want to save a derivative, you can hit plus. And what I typically do is I'll um, prepend the name with whatever it is I, I change. So maybe you know, maybe I changed um, uh, Z lift. So I'll do Z lift point whatever for and then dash and then save it that way. That way, as I'm going through my settings, I can see, okay, yeah, these were my good settings and I changed this one parameter. And then maybe the this does become my good settings, but at least if I go back, I have an intuition as to what it was I changed. So that's just a, you know, a little, little tip there. Um, and that's the same for print settings and printer settings. So those are your three categories of settings that you see here. So you got your machine, your filament, and your print settings. So 
Um, yeah, so over to the printer, um, we already kind of touched on build volume. Um, that's your printable area. Your nozzle diameter is the size of your nozzle. Um, the Z lift and retraction, I'm gonna just keep these on for all eternity unless I have a reason to turn them off. Uh, reason, to, reason to turn them off, maybe uh, you're doing a print with no supports whatsoever and you wanna minimize stringing. Um, you know, maybe you turn them off for that reason. And, um, and, you know, I probably should, but so far, um, whether it's been a part that needs support or not, uh, the stringing hasn't been bad, bad enough to warrant the laziness that is to change that setting. Uh, also just a little tip, um, if you get yourself a little, uh, torch, um, so, uh, you know, you go to Amazon and get yourself like a little butane chef torch, um, just looking one up right now to show you what I'm talking about. Get yourself one of these things, um, a really quick pass over, um, you don't want to hold the heat too much, but a quick pass over strings and they will melt right away without, uh, leaving any, um, you know, shiny spot or any type of, uh, mark on your, uh, on your printed object. And you can see these things are, are pretty, pretty cheap. So, uh, maybe a good thing to, um, to buy and, um, and if I was going to buy another one, I would get one of these that fits on the top of a butane can just to make that way I can avoid needing to refill the torch. I could just, you know, throw the can away and get a new one. Um, anyway, um, machine limits. This is a very important setting. As a matter of fact, uh, this is probably the most important setting that you're going to change. Um, it's these maximum acceleration limits out of the box, any cubic, if you're using their profile, has these set to 10,000 millimeters per second. And I can tell you with certainty on the Y axis, uh, this will cause layer shifting on large prints. Um, it may not happen consistently, but it will happen to you if you leave that at 10,000 millimeters per second. Um, so I've got them set to 5,000 millimeters per second. Um, the Z is set to 300. I don't recall why. I did that, um, but maybe it had something to do with the default and cutting that. In, maybe the default was 6,000 and I just cut it in half. Um, but um, but that needs to be changed in my opinion and shame on any cubic for having them at beyond what they even recommend uh, out of the default profile. That's just laziness and they really should correct that. As a matter of fact, they should go back in my opinion in the slicer and they should make all of these recommended defaults what they recommend not just slicer defaults it's just kind of ridiculous that that you're seeing values here that don't match the profiles they provide uh, although maybe maybe this is because they do make a various amounts of uh you know different models of printers and maybe these are the minimum settings that their smallest slowest printer can handle i, I don't know in, in that case i guess that's fine Jerk limits, uh, minimum feed rates, never messed around with them, don't know what they do. Um, and um, again, maximum feed rates, never messed around with it, don't know what it does. Um, and also have never, never, um, oh. oh, okay, well, I guess that doesn't do that. So um, anyway, so that's that. And then um, G code. Uh, so this is something that I've played around with quite a bit. Um, what I find is uh, with the factory G code, what happens is the, the printer will heat up uh, the bed and the nozzle and it will wait for those temperatures to come to temp before it makes any movements. Once they come to temp, it will home. So it will move the nozzle to the back corner of the build plate uh, where it can hit its limit switches and know the position. You always have to keep in mind these machines are dumb. Uh, as good as they are, they're dumb machines. Once, once they start a print, they're following a set of instructions. They're doing what they're told. And, um, and there's no feedback mechanism for the printer to understand if it's successfully or not successfully doing what it's told. So what it does is it homes, putting it in a known position. So it goes back, hits the limit switch there, it hits the limit switch over here. Um, and then it can calculate the number of steps it takes to get over. So it hits the limit switch here. It then calculates the number of steps it takes to get here and it knows exactly where it's at. And then 
it hits the limit switch on the bed and knows exactly where the bed's at and then it starts its movements. Um, and what happens is it lowers the nozzle and then drags the nozzle. Uh, and I find that because the nozzle's hot, um, especially if you're printing with PLA uh, or TPU or really any, any material probably would do this, um, it can ooze out of the nozzle and drag a little snot line across your build plate. And if your objects are in the middle of the build plate, no big deal. But if you're printing something big, that becomes an artifact in your in your first layer. And that sucks. So the modified G-code that I have, the way it works is it will, before starting any movements, it will heat the build plate. Um, once the build plate comes to temperature, it will immediately start heating the nozzle um, to 180 degrees Celsius, which is hot enough that um, if it were to obtain that set point, um, it's almost ready to print, but not so hot that it should enable the material in the nozzle to ooze. Um, while it's heating that nozzle, it homes. And I found that it never gets to 180 degrees, by the way, by before it's done. So, you know, I guess in theory, I could just go right to print temperature. Um, but as a safety guard in the event that something happened, I, I don't want the chance of material oozing. Maybe I'm going from one print directly to another and the nozzle was already hot. And um, yeah, so it homes and then it drags the nozzle at 180 degrees or less, gets to this point, then it sits the nozzle on the build plate, it gets to print temperature, then it lifts the nozzle up, it will drag out a 25 millimeter line and then it starts the print. So that's what my G-code does. And, um, and I have the settings here, you can follow them. Um, I also added this line here for loading the bed, bed mesh, uh, which is for auto leveling in my testing. It doesn't seem to make a difference, but, um, and a lot of the feedback I see dictates that this doesn't make a difference, but I put it in there. It doesn't hurt, uh, to have it to the best of my understanding. Um, but this is my start G code and I can copy and paste this into the comments or the description of the video, and I will, uh, but um, I cannot do the stop G code uh, because it has brackets and YouTube doesn't let you um, put brackets in video descriptions. So you'll just have to match this. Um, the NG code, so what I found is, you know, you go to, to print a small object like, um, like these little scrapers, Right. And oftentimes I'll print an entire bed of these little scrapers. I've got about 20 of them sitting on a shelf right now because I use them all the time. And, you know, the, the end of them gets messed up pretty quick. Uh, but I think they're great because it's the same material the build plate's made for. So your chance of scratching the build plate is non existent with these. And then also, um, as you're scraping, you can really dig the corners down and you can get um, material off the build plate that. Otherwise, I don't know how you would get off without, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, so if you're doing something small like this, the thing prints and then the nozzle would lift like up to here, like crazy high. And the problem with that is your, your spool is over here and it's pulling all that PLA off the spool or whatever material you're using. And then you go to start the next print and it lowers the nozzle. And then what is it doing with all of that filament that it pulled off? Well, it's coiling up over here in some random fashion then it starts printing and it's pulling that coil into the filament sensor it may get tangled and the extruder can no longer pull filament and then you have a failed print that way um, it may put resistance on and you just get inconsistent layer lines it may snap the filament um, it may recover itself and never have an issue i just thought that was really stupid and wasteful like just how dumb is that why why would you lift the nozzle way high and buy, you know, if anybody wants to correct my thought process on this, by all means, I'd love to understand a reason. Why would you, you, you know how high your last layer was, just lift the nozzle a little bit and pull the bed plate out. Uh, it doesn't need to be 10 feet off the build plate when it's done. So that's what my ending G code is. Um, and I can tell you right now, I don't understand the code. Um, and you know, I, do automation programming for a living. So I just haven't put the effort in to understand it, but I could see these um, taking layer heights and multiplying is applying that distance 
And so these are the numbers that I, I don't remember what numbers I changed, but if you look at the numbers, those are what I changed. I didn't change any of the code. If, if not, maybe to just remove a layer, a line or two, I don't remember, but, um, but I was modifying the multipliers here. Uh, so if you just look at the numbers, you can, you can figure out how to modify your NG code. Cause otherwise it's just, um, you know, bog standard, uh, what was included in the any cubic profile. So, um, I think that is everything, um, worth mentioning about the any cubic slicer. Um, you know, I mentioned, or maybe I didn't mention, but I chose this because of the concise choice of options along with the ability to remote print. Um, and I will also just point out that if you are using the remote print feature, first of all, this is very normal in my experience. It takes a while um, before, I guess, it is able to reach out to the cloud and then pull back what printers you have available. Um, but um, if you choose a printer from remote, which both my printers are actively printing something, so I can't, um, but if I did and I sent this to the printer, it will upload this to your instance of any cubic cloud um, and it will keep it there for all eternity. This is not like a, you know, inkjet printer. It won't send the file and then the printer delete the file when it's done. It sends it to the cloud and then the cloud initiates the printing with the printer and then the cloud holds the file, which my God, any cubic, I wish you would put in a setting to automatically delete from the cloud once it's down to the printer. Um, I really wish you would because I didn't know that I printed a bunch of stuff and then I one day tried to remote print and got an error saying my cloud storage was full. And so to combat that, then you can log into your account and you can see all the files that you've uploaded. Um, and either from here, or I think you can do it on the app. I've never tried. Uh, this is the only way to delete your files. And I'll tell you, it's a manual process. There's no batch delete that I could find. Um, but I will say that if you do it fast enough, you can hit delete and okay for about four files uh, before it goes to refresh the page. And if you delete four files, it'll, it'll refresh four times, but I'll tell you, it's, it's still faster than doing them one refresh, one refresh, one refresh. It's really annoying, um, man, any cubic, if you are listening and you can fix this, um, please fix it. There's no reason to store these files to the, to the cloud without selecting that as an option first. I understand the value of having files here that you print frequently and then being able to just log in the app and send that file to your printer, but to automatically store everything that you remote print, that is not the behavior I think most people are going to expect. And then to find out after months of using your printer that you had two gigs of storage and now I have 5,000 things inside of your cloud that I have to go and delete to clean that up. That is a um, that is a negative perception of your company is what that is, and I think you just only benefits you to try to mitigate negative perception. So unlock your firmware, please. Fix this feature in your slicer. If not, add remote print as an option from a computer uh, for any type of slicer, uh, and life will be better for everyone. So. That concludes this video. Uh, I'm going to end it with a montage of the settings and uh, enjoy.